Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to the SR House. Uh, for those who don't know us, and I think most of you all do, uh, Avid Learning is the cultural arm and uh, cultural arm and learning platform of the SR Group. We have conducted over a thousand programs across multiple formats, like workshops, panel discussions, seminars, festivals. Mm -hmm and connected with 125,000 individuals since our inception in 2009. In fact, this year we celebrate 10 years of our programming. With a focus on four core areas, the arts, literature, culture and heritage, and innovation, our curatorial vision is, includes presenting symposiums, conferences, and targeted discussions such as this that probe meta issues and initiatives. Our vision is to invite more people into the conversation about the arts and culture by deepening their multicultural learning experience through sustained partnerships and by diversifying our programming through new spaces, formats, and approaches. It is in this light that we're glad to work again with the University of Edinburgh, having collaborated with them last year to host a series of events showcasing, um, and showcasing distinguished faculty and professors from their university's varied departments in fact, we're very lucky to have one of them back with us here again. Uh, so without further ado, on behalf of the University of Edinburgh and Avid Learning, welcome to Beyond Bauer, Tropical Modernism in Architecture Today, a panel discussion which will trace the four decades long architectural journey of renowned Sri Lankan architect Jeffrey Baba and examine his influences on contemporary architectural styles. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our very distinguished and um, impressive panel, architect, writer, and professor, University of Edinburgh, Ed Hollis. Welcome back, Ed. Um, architect and co-founder, architecture brio, Robert Verreit, Ver sorry. Architect, <laughs> photographer, and joint principal at Abraham John Architects, Alan Abraham. And our moderator for the evening, managing editor at beautifulhomes.com, uh, Sanhita Sinha Chaudhary. Before, before uh, Sanita comes up, I'll just tell you a little bit about the format. We've actually asked our very distinguished panel to present, so they're going to be doing a short presentation. Sanita is going to do some opening remarks. After our presentations, we'll actually assemble the panel on the stage. But before we start, uh, you know, take these out, put them on silent. I heard some phones ringing. And start using them, posting, reposting, tagging. Our handle is at Avid Learning, and our hashtag is Learning Never Stops. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful discussion. Over to you, Sanita. This year marks the 100th birth anniversary of Jeffrey Bava, Sri Lanka's most influential architect, the man who changed the face of Southeast Asian architecture and the father of tropical modernism. Today, with insights from our panelists, we are going to understand Bava's journey as he gave up his short-lived career as a lawyer and became an architect at 38. We'll delve into his commitment to regional architecture We'll talk about how he could easily civilize a landscape with a simple planter. We'll discuss the theatrics of his structures and his obsession with framing the views. We will also talk about how he delivered Sri Lanka's first sustainable LEED certified building. While it is impossible to talk about Sri Lankan architecture without mentioning Bava, Bava's work too was heavily influenced and inspired by the region. Christopher Beaver, of GA Architects in London once asked him in the 1970s, if you were an architect living and working in the West, what sort of architecture would you have produced? In his response, Bava said, I probably wouldn't have been an architect. We will also explore the impact of, the, of his work on the region's architecture and focus on learnings from it for India as a country and Mumbai as a city. I will now ask Ed to come on stage and begin his presentation. When I was uh, in his office, uh, I was working on two very, very different buildings. And the first of them uh, was this one, um, the Kandalama Hotel, which is up in the dry zone uh, of Sri Lanka, the kind of central uh, region. 
Um, it, it's a deceptive, these are deceptive images. Um, this is a building that looks like it's disappeared. Uh, there's a pool with no edge looking out at a tank in the middle of the jungle. Uh, there's uh, a building which seems to be made of glass and plants. Um, what I was involved in designing um, was the bathrooms uh, in this hotel where it was designed that as you stood in the shower, you opened the windows uh, amid all the greenery and looked at the ancient rock fortress of Sigiriya uh, in the distance. And this is a building that looks, in a sense, uncompromisingly modern. If we think of one definition uh, of tropical modernism, it's this, uh, a building which is a frame open to the climate all around it, allowing nature to come through that building. And I'm going to return to that theme in a second. But the other building I was working on was this, which is a small pavilion uh, in uh, Bawa's own garden uh, at Lunuganga, uh, uh, down on the southwest coast of Sri Lanka. And this was a very different affair. This building was occasioned, the reason this building was built uh, is because Bawa uh, was given uh, two windows, you can see, uh, as gifts by a friend. So there's this one and then these pairs of shutters. Uh, and they were being taken uh, from buildings which were being demolished uh, as the Gaul Road, the main road going up and down the coast of Sri Lanka, uh, was uh, being widened. Uh, what happens, you'll know it here, they always chop off the veranda first and then they chop off the front room and the next room and the houses get narrower and narrower. Uh, but there's a great market in second-hand architecture uh, in Sri Lanka and this building was built uh, to reuse that second-hand architecture. There was one drawing. It was the size of this piece of the laptop screen you can see here. The rest of it happened on site uh, with Mr. Barwa sitting there in a chair kind of gesturing to the builders going, well, can you move the, the window a bit to the left? It doesn't look quite right. Uh, and then sending them down to the lake uh, to get mud to put on the wall to make it go moldy as fast as possible so that it would look as if it had always been there. And the reputation of Geoffrey Barwa is very much, I would suggest, uh, based on the idea of uh, some sort of tropical modernism maybe exists between these two very different sort of poles. And I want to show you two earlier works uh, of Bawa undertaken in collaboration with the architect Ulrich Plesner, um, which show perhaps these approaches. So this is uh, an estate bungalow uh, in a rubber estate uh, at a place called Palontalawa, um, where you can see architecture reduced to its most simple possible diagram. Um, if you're in Sri Lanka, it never gets cold, it's always wet, uh, it's always sunny and wet at the same time. Uh, and what you need is a roof, and what you need is something to hold up the roof, so you need a large beam, which you can see beginning here, and then you need something to hold up the beam. Uh, so what he used here was the site, the rocks of the site, and that was that. This building is designed to appear uh, to be the most simple, possible, modern, transparent uh, conjunction uh, between nature and architecture. But around the same time, uh, Bawa was designing, uh, again with Plesner, this house uh, for the batik artist um, Ina de Silva, um, who brought all sorts of objects of her own collecting uh, from her family estate at Alawahara uh, in the centre of the country, so like these columns and these bowls and these millstones. And this house, uh, rather than appearing to be modern, uh, appears to be very old indeed. In fact, it's made out of the fragments of all sorts of buildings. There are the doors of temples, the columns of houses, and in a strange twist of fate, this building itself has now been demolished and rebuilt somewhere else uh, as well. So the second hand has become the third hand uh, in uh, a curious uh, twist of fate. Barwa's own career, it's been mentioned that he came to architecture late, um, and originally, he, he was a lawyer. Um, I remember him saying that the world was very fortunate that he had ceased to be a lawyer. Um, there were lots of people who found more justice when he stopped uh, practicing the law than when he was doing it. <laughs> uh, and in his uh, garden, uh, and, and in a sense, what started him in his enthusiasm uh, for architecture uh, was gardening. Um, and this is uh, one image of his garden uh, at Lunuganga, uh, in, again on the south coast of Sri Lanka, where again we can see this wonderful sense of we have no idea really where the architecture stops and the landscape begins, and indeed we have no sense of where the garden stops and the landscape 
uh, begins. There's a wonderful sensation if you go to Lunuganga that it's a place which nobody has been looking after for years. It feels like it's falling to pieces. I remember asking him uh, whether that was on purpose and he looked a little bit irritated and said, yes, of course, it's on purpose. It was designed to look like an overgrown ruin of a garden that you had discovered by mistake. Uh, as so many of his buildings were designed to look like buildings that had happened through happy accidents that had been thrown together by mistake, growing out of the land and the mud uh, around them. But this is a subtle game. So the garden is filled, for example, uh, with rice paddies. So you, you imagine this kind of farmland, but then the rice paddy is somehow civilised with the appropriation of this little shrine stone, or indeed... Uh, an Apollo statue brought back from Europe uh, on travels as well. So these are subtle games uh, with wilderness. And I think one thing that should never be underestimated about Bawa is how intensely theatrical this all is. There's nothing natural about any of this. Okay? Uh, and that's its art. That's its cleverness. Where did it come from? Uh, Sanhita mentioned the architecture uh, of Minette de Silva. And what I want to suggest is that these two strands have always been present, particularly... Uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, Minette de Silva uh, was a woman architect practicing in the 1940s and 50s uh, in Sri Lanka and was a much more of the no-nonsense kind. She was like, architecture's there to serve the people. We need to respond to modern conditions. We just need to get on with it and build a straightforward, clear, functional architecture uh, as uh, we can. But there's always another strand to Sri Lankan culture. And I just wanted to, this photograph of one of Minette de Silva's buildings here was taken by a character called, sorry, I'll just point it there, was taken by a character called Lionel Went, who was a member of what was called the 43 Group, a group of artists and painters uh, working in Sri Lanka uh, just around the time of independence, who were playing very subtle games with surrealism. Uh, Lionel Went is the kind of Man Ray uh, of South Asia. This kind of he's a wonderful use of collage and comedy, uh, putting strange images next to each other. And this is a wonderful strand uh, that runs through uh, Sri Lankan art and, uh, and architecture in the 20th century. And it's to do with what Sri Lanka imagines it is. Sri Lanka is uh, the battle about culture in Sri Lanka has been about essentialism, going here we are, we are the one pure true people, or are we an island which is on the way to everywhere else? Um, and it's both of those things at the same time. And these subtle games with collage are very much part of that. So where does it take us? I want to show you just two images of what contemporary Sri Lankan architecture might be. This is a house designed by Emila de Mel, uh, who worked uh, for Bawa uh, in, uh, towards the end of his career, made out of the discarded pieces of a tea factory, uh, transported and, and, and put together. Uh, this is from... Uh, the uh, recent Biennale uh, in Sri Lanka, trying to get people to use streets in the more crowded inner city areas. But of course, like much of the rest uh, of Asia, actually this is the reality uh, of uh, most architectural development. This is a new doubling of the size of Colombo, um, which has been paid for uh, with uh, a massive sort of Chinese investment uh, that's now going up, kind of expanding the city. And so the debates in Sri Lanka uh, about how to go beyond Bawa um, are challenged uh, by uh, this kind of world uh, because one has to ask oneself uh, the extent to which, uh, what function can a tropical modernism play uh, in this kind of context. So I'm going to leave it there and uh, pass on. Thank you, Avid Learning, for inviting me to come and speak here about uh, Jeffrey Bauer and beyond. I'm a Dutch architect uh, from uh, the Netherlands, but I live here in Mumbai, and I ended up in Mumbai after a detour in Sri Lanka. And I guess Bauer is partly to blame for me ending up in this part of the world. What attracted me to Bauer's architecture was that in contrast to the prevalent Dutch architecture of the time that always shouted out for attention within its context, his work seemed to not impose itself on its surrounding, but instead do the opposite. The untamed wildness of Sri Lankan tropical nature instead determined his architecture 
in its conceptualization and overtake and dominate it in reality. I got the opportunity to work on a retrospective exhibition of Bauer's work, and we made a model of the Ruhuna University and the Bentuta Beach Hotel, one of Bauer's earlier works from 1967. This was especially challenging because Bauer's office never really kept a decent record of his drawings. According to Amel Ademel, he disposed most of his construction drawings in a well when he vacated his old ERB office in the 90s. Most of those famous and beautiful drawings that are known of his projects are made after the fact. So we had to improvise using photographs and photocopying his miniature, scaleless drawings uh, that, you've, that you found in books. Now the Bentuda Beach Hotel is very curious in his oeuvre because it's an interesting combination of typologies. The base of the hotel is a stone fortress like plinth, inclusive of bastions in the corner, almost pastiche-like, referencing an earlier Dutch fort that had occupied the site. And through this dark, dark stone base, the staircase leads you up to a batik lined lobby ceiling and then wraps around the courtyard on the first floor. Then there's a second and third floor that is an L-shaped wing and orient to, do, to the view of the beach on one side and the lagoon on the other side. And the wraparound veranda acts on the inside as circulation and on the outside as private balconies overlooking the view. So there are three building typologies here overlapping. One is a solid fort, then two is a courtyard building, and then on top of that, a seamlessly floating modernist L-shaped wing. The preparation for this exhibition took about six months. It was featured in the Dam in Frankfurt, and I made this base in solid wood. And models didn't exist, actually, of, of, of any of these buildings. So it was the first time that actually models were made. Not just like the drawings, they were made after the fact. The plinth of the building was cast in concrete, and the stones that you see here, in the, in the, were, that they were carved into the wooden base, impersonating the dramatic rocks that are jutting out of the swimming pool that Bauer designed. The railing of the veranda was made uh, with natural fiber taken from a broom lying in the corner of the office. And an interesting detail is, is the cantilever on the first floor, on the top floor, actually. Bauer would have wanted to make the corner as transparent and light as possible in, light with, in line with modernist tendencies, making a building floating. Now, Bauer's work is generally not remembered for its structural innovativeness. But if you look closely, you went to great length to achieve this lightness. The corner of the building was actually inset and missed the column where one logically expected one. So finally, last year, during renovations of the hotel, Chana Daswata discovered that the whole veranda is actually cantilevered and suspended from a concrete beam hidden in this tropical roof. <coughs> After the exhibition was complete, completed, we stayed on and worked on extensions and refurbishments of some of his seminal projects. Being able to uh, closely study and experience Baba's work we were very influenced by its apparent naturalness and simplicity. But it was also interesting to observe that this simplicity was actually the result of surprisingly intensive interventions. We saw this building, the Candela Motel, for example, is the highlight of architecture playing the disappearing act. But behind the soft blanket of, of creepers and lianas, and um, rooftop lawns, and I want to blow some myths here, lies a very straightforward and utilitarian scheme. A critical journalist I met in Sri Lanka complained that all Bauer's late hotels look like ordinary hospitals. And that is very true here. The columns and beams of the structural schemes are violently anchored into the rock surfaces of the forest it sits in. And the framework twist and turns here and there to accommodate itself and create experiential interest, but in no way does architecture stop being geometric. 
defined by man-made logic and measurement systems. And on the other hand, in no way does nature, although helped along its way by the human hand, stop doing what it does best, adapt, evolve, improvise, and surprise. The Lunar Ganga Garden is, of course, one of the masterpieces by Baba, more so because it's not about buildings here. The garden is about light, skill, proportion, and time. <laughs> so in a way, it's, of course, about architecture. But I'd never really understood the paddy field garden near the lake until I visited once after a heavy downpour. The concrete checkerboard pattern laid in between the grass flooded. And now, lake, garden, and architecture collapsed into one. Bauer's obsession with laying down geometries into the landscape resonated those inside the estate bungalow. He did not subjugate nature to the will of man, but in a way transformed our experience of nature by creating a contrast that only highlights the rawness and unpredictability of nature. Apart from one of his last projects, the Marissa House, here on the screen, Baba's work relies heavily on vernacular typologies and construction methods. While the relationships with the land were innovative and always surprising, typologies and spatial conf configurations were often not, and construction techniques neither. But Baba was not interested in architecture being a product of conceptual thinking. In 2006, we moved to Mumbai to start our own practice, and we were looking to practice an architecture that combined the primacy of context as the essential generator of built form, resonating with our learnings in Sri Lanka, with a conceptual framework, innovating with building typologies to address the challenges of our time. In our work, we were looking to create an architecture that could have strong characters, but at the same time would be able to establish essential and chameleonizing relationships with its context. We more often than not work in remote locations in extreme climates and coordinate processes and construction over long distances, like this school for stateless children in Malaysia, or the site on a cliff in the Himalayas where we are building a micro cabin. And we got the opportunity to design a house in the Western Ghats of India, close to Mumbai, in the start of our career. This landscape is rapidly taken over by pretentious villas and urbanization. But if the per peripheries around the cities are the much needed green lungs, but simultaneously are the places that are next up for grabs, how do we establish significant relationships with it? Can it be invisible? Here, the roof of the house sits just below the top of the hillock, camouflaging itself in the silhouette of the undulating landscape. The roof merges with the top of the hill. The landscape continues over the roof, hiding the house from view when you approach it. What you see, gazing down from the top of the hill, is just a cover of green. Underneath the grass cover, the house has expansive views of its surrounding. There's something sublime in the dramatic collision between the order of geometry and an unpredictability of nature. This house is a combination of several typologies as well. An underground house, a courthouse house, a veranda house, and a lookout post. The architectural sequence of rock carved courtyards, kitchen, dining room, veranda, screen deck and pool, and the riparian landscape is an experiential one, but also acts as an instrument to measure oneself against the vastness of space. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, guys. Um, so I'm uh, the outside perspective, the beyond perspective. I'm only half a Baba. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I dropped out of college, and I kind of graduated late, kind of graduated. 
So um, in that sense, I respect Jeffrey Bauer because he also was a bit like me. So, yeah. But what's important is that uh, uh, what? Uh, sorry. So what's important is that I think that uh, Bauer looked at things in its time and with its region. So context was very important. As Robson said, he was an architect of place, which responded to the physical and cultural context, and he used traditional materials and construction uh, methods to create spaces. Now, we think about 1967, think about 2019, it's about 52 years, so modernism is kind of stretched in this period. Uh, the works here are ours, uh, but it demonstrates a similar kind of aesthetic. This is my father, he's my teacher, and he still practices, he's 81. And um, yeah, so basically we do interiors, which kind of gets the bread and butter. So interiors pay, and Bombay we do interiors, so everything's um, tropical in that we work in this country. And uh, in interiors also we like to get the light and the landscape into it. So it's basically uh, about the kind of materials we use, the kind of uh, things we use, kind of marrying the current with uh, what's possible. And um, yeah, I'll just run through these and I'll come to a certain project. Then uh, we're moving to different places. So from interiors, I'll move to architecture, a uh, place in Khandala where you have rainfall and all, a uh, sloping roof response to it. Uh, you have spaces happening. You have the natural elements happening, which is in situ, on site, just as the building happens. And a lot of our buildings are built like Ed had said, uh, on site. We kind of modify it, you know? Uh, internal courtyards, because privacy is very important in the especially when people have money and they can afford architects, it's very nice. Uh, we don't have a Rolls Royce yet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, kind of working with that and hoping that the landscape does overtake things, it's very important. So uh, we like spaces to be very, um, like the architecture to kind of disappear. Working in Jodhpur, less rainfall, flat roof, jali, a traditional element, uh, working with things like uh, where the client has a certain need, and if you look at the neighboring buildings, they're very different. They're very like um, on it. So people are kind of meeting. Everything is a partnership. I think the client is extremely important in the architectural process. And uh, we like the openness. At the same time, people want privacy. So courtyards tend to be internal, even though the plot sizes are nearly limited. This is a townhouse. And you'll see that elements like uh, the jalis and all give you a sense of expanse. At the same time, they bring in the shade and the privacy that's required within. And internal skylights, internal courtyards, uh, including in the bathrooms and stuff, makes a lot of difference to the sense and experience of space. Um, coming to a recent project of us in Goa, um, we were blessed with a site which had a lot of coconut trees, which the client wanted all cut. Uh, we didn't. We suggested that we build around the trees, which is easier said than done, because coconut trees are not really very beautiful, you know, to the client, especially when he's got a lot of money. And, uh, it was fortunate for us that he kind of agreed to it. So here's a little uh, uh, concept thing that where we worked with the trees, which were eight year old, and everyone said they'll fall, but they've not yet fallen. So it's good. And we kind of preserved the trees, and we built around the trees, like fingers around, you know? So um, taking into context the space, and taking into context the region, our architecture changes from like a Jodhpur to a Goa. And that's the... That's a picture from top, so you see the trees, that's a night view, and um, every room has natural ventilation. We are from India, we love natural ventilation, we love light, we love openness, and um, we play around with that. There's a seasonal stream in front, so when you hear the water, it's even nicer. So it's good to get nature in, really. Um, yeah, and uh, we tend to use materials and labor of the region, so that's, that's our kind of, a, so the materiality is uh, important. Sorry, is it, I not used to speaking in the mic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. So that's the that's just the context because for us, at the end of the day, the trees are more important than the building, and we really like it if the building kind of sits into its landscape, sits into its context, and uh, works overall. You should know where you are. If you go at the end of the day to another place and you don't experience the space. It's kind of a pity. If you're in a closed room, like a lot of houses we've seen have basements and stuff, if you're just stuck in a place which looks like any other place anywhere else in the world, it's kind of beating the purpose to going there. And uh, yeah, so landscape forms a very important part of our projects. And uh, we introduce it into our interiors, into architecture. And what we uh, want to do is also to transform the city. Now, Bombay is quite a third world place, actually speaking, if we kind of de-romanticize the notion of being from this space. 
So uh, in Bombay, fortunately, now one of our projects is happening in Bandra. And uh, Robert and I are involved in a, another group, which is Bandra Collective, where we do city spaces and kind of improve designs. This is something uh, we had proposed at Mount Mary. And uh, it's, it's a small staircase that was used as a dump yard. It's about five stories high. And we've created a city space out of it, because that's, that's kind of important to us. And a friend of mine went to Sri Lanka and sent a picture back just recently of some hotel where Bawa had done similar kind of ramps and stairs. So this is happening. So guys, if you'll go to Bandra, it's happening very slowly, but it's happening. And that's the model on the left. That's construction on the right. So you can see the scale of project. It's, it's kind of fun. That's, uh, that's fun, because kids are using it already. <laughs> And um, extending that, we've done some projects for the city, including this very crowded area called Malakshmi. But this one here is um, Andheri Station, and a proposal to kind of improve this space. We've done proposals for Bandra Station and other places. And we really think if you're on this planet, it's good to enjoy uh, nature, the landscape, the environment. So these are, these are some public proposals that we've got. So we kind of scale from like product design to interiors to urban design, because we get really bored. I get really bored. And it's nice to kind of change things around. So um, um, this um, is what it is. So yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we can start with what is tropical modernism, the distinct styles and features that sort of define this movement. And Baba's contribution to it, um, I believe he, he started, he's, coined, he's called the father of uh, tropical modernism. So how that came to be. OK. Um, I could do a kind of very potted kind of art historical issue here, which I suppose is the, f the f take the word modernism. Um, and what do we mean by modernism? Because I've certainly been at kind of architectural history worlds where people go, modernism is what happened in Berlin between 1920 and 1929 and nothing else. Uh, but um, modernism as an architectural way of designing, I'm not going to call it a style because all modernists would set fire to themselves if they heard that it was a style, um, is, is, is a kind of, uh, was a universal idea in the same way that modernity and modernization is a universal idea. Um, and so an architect like Le Corbusier, uh, for instance, felt the license somehow to come to India and tell everyone how to design everything, um, or Louis Kahn, or whoever it might be. Um, so there's an idea about modernism that it's universal, um, and that everybody, therefore, deserves white walls and flat roofs and long, thin windows made of glass. Um, and then you find yourself saying, well, what does that mean if you're not in southern France, uh, but you're in uh, a country like India or Sri Lanka, where firstly the climatic differences are fundamental. I mean, I keep on looking at buildings here and thinking, how do these people manage, you know, with somewhere which is completely dry for nine months of the year and then completely wet for three months of the year? I'm just used to it being wet and cold all year, so it's easy. But it's... Um, it, it, so it has to deal with a set of conditions that all that proper German modernism of the 1920s with its white walls and its flat roofs was never designed to deal with. And so I think that's one challenge to the idea of modernism. What does it mean in the tropics where there's a different climate? But the other one is a different technology. Modernism meant or is meant to mean historically the architecture of the machine. But what does Geoffrey Bauer do in the 1950s and 60s when there are no machines? Uh, what do you do when there is no concrete? In the 1970s, you couldn't import concrete to Sri Lanka. Uh, you know, you, you, there wasn't the luxury of saying, well, let's have reinforced steel cantilevers uh, and so on. Actually, you have to work with what's there and the technologies uh, that are there. Um, so it's, it, it's a modulation of, of, of those two things, I suggest. So there, there's a kind of tension between something which is posing as universal, the solution to everything. And then you go, well, is it actually the solution where I am now? Uh, and can we do it? Of course it would look nice if everything could look like some sparkling architecture magazine in Berlin in the 1920s, but actually, uh, what happens in the real world? Um, I think tropical modernism, modernism is um, something that's tropical and something that's in its time. <laughs> 
So I wouldn't stylize it. I mean, put a name to it. But I think, uh, yeah, that's what it is. So he was a modernist, and so are we, I guess. If you're using the methods of the time, you're kind of a modernist without getting linguistic about the whole thing. Yeah. And what does that mean for India today? And especially for a city like Bombay and uh, areas around Bombay, looking at Alibag, Goa, what does that mean? Well, we are, um, there's a nice garden out here. If you go up and look up, there's a glass building above. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of uh, different from what one would expect from the tropics. Um, also in terms of context, in terms of materiality and stuff like that, you'd want to source locally, you'd want to build locally. You'd want to kind of, you have different food and different costumes, and it's nice to maintain your identity to that level and to develop it. And I think architecture also should go by the same route. Um, what I, I mean, what you could probably build on is talking about a lot of the Baba structures existed in not just cities, in the, not necess necessarily in the heart of cities. Um, so when you're talking about, you know, building up, when you're talking about high rises, are there elements that we can, or are there learnings from his work that for people like us who are living in a city that we can take and? I think uh, definitely, because design does get value, but builders, unfortunately, we don't do building work, builder work, but builders don't look at uh, design as value. They look at the FSI and calculation of square footage. They could build better buildings and better looking and better risk, uh, more responsive buildings uh, and still get a lot of money in because profit is there if you're building in Bombay. So I think it's more of an approach kind of a thing, and it's always partnership. So you can't blame only the architect or only the client because everything is, um, I think it's a marriage. So. Um, Robert, you wanted to talk about his work in landscape design and how it's often sort of understood that um, he captured nature and framed nature, but it's not just the fact that his architecture got lost in that, it, it, it was very geometric, very hardcore. So if you would like to go. Yeah. Yeah, so if you really look at the word uh, nature, what that means and what landscape actually means, we have to, I think, to refine that a little bit more. Because when we say nature, we think maybe of like raw, untouched nature. And actually, if you think of it, that raw, untouched nature doesn't exist, right? There's actually not even a word that exists that describes raw, untouched nature. Because as soon as someone looks at nature, it means that it becomes uh, cultured. It means that it is uh, thought of in a way that, that uh, where uh, nature is set in a certain, certain context. Uh, nature becomes uh, framed, like in a landscape painting, right? We all, Jeffrey Bauer, uh, had certain thoughts of landscape. His parents, his grandparents, the Romantics, and the hunter-gatherers 20,000 years ago, they all gathered ideas and knowledge about what nature is and what it means to us. So when he frames the landscape, it is not just his eyes that see the landscape, it is all of us, or the collective understanding of nature, what, what frames that. Um, interestingly, uh, Ulrich Plessner, which worked with him in, in, in the early years, uh, said it very nicely in, 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 in an article that he, that he wrote. He said that the gardening that, he, that they did at Lunaganga was almost like, uh, like action painting. You know, where you throw paint, the artist throws paint on the canvas, and then the artist responds to what the paint does, and the painting actually does what, what feedback it gives to the artist, and the artist responds back to that. And that's how Luna Ganga also in, uh, kind of evolved. And Ed mentioned that, you know, there were no drawings, there were, there were instructions on site, and things were moved left and right, depending on, 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 the, the, on what was ap appearing. Um, and and, and that's, that's, that's interesting, that idea of action painting is actually action gardening, right? And just like Jackson Pollock painted a painting, uh, which almost, well, he, he was, I think, I guess, quite frustrated that he had to have a canvas, right? That he just couldn't continue on and on. Uh, Baba somehow managed to do that, right? He managed to, 
paints with this architecture and with this landscape um, and create boundaries between them, blurred boundaries between them. Uh, a frame of a view was there. So sometimes it was a painting, but often there was something behind that, which was also architecture, like a, another framed door. And beyond that, there was something else. And then when you, as a person, moving through his work, uh, uh, we don't look at, uh, at architecture as a painting, we move through spaces. You constantly have things that are revealed and that are obscured. You obs reveal something and obscure something else. So he, his paintings, in a way, became endless in, in, to infinity. His garden at Lunaganga didn't end at boundary. It ended in the horizon. Um, when we were talking earlier, Ed, you mentioned about uh, vernacular architecture and the challenges that often come with using local materials, mm -hmm. using local craftsmanship, the training that sort of goes on, especially when you're building at that scale. So would you shed some light? Sure, yeah. I mean, the, the one context that should be said about the kind of most vernacular work of Jeffrey Barwa um, is that it was taking place in a period of time, in particular in Sri Lanka, where imports of things to Sri Lanka weren't allowed um, or almost impossible. It's fascinating. There's a kind of counter-history of Lunuganga, the garden, um, which is that it's a farm. So there's a building called the hen house and there's a building called the cow barn. Now, none of them were faintly ever used for chickens or cows and Geoffrey Barwell wasn't interested in farming um, in the slightest. Um, but they were there for government inspectors um, who would turn up <laughs> and to go, well, of course, you know, I've been working very hard tilling the land. Uh, I'm a horny-handed son of toil. Anyway, get me another gin and tonic. And, um, <laughs> and, and the, the vernacular of those buildings is in itself a fascinating confection. I think I, think I mentioned that, that, that a lot of these buildings are collages of pieces of other buildings. And in a sense, it's exactly uh, like Robert said, what he, he's done in these strange modern collages of old buildings is reframe what we think traditional Sri Lankan architecture is like. So you suddenly find yourself inadvertently wandering around, particularly southwestern Sri Lanka, looking for buildings that look like Jeffrey Bawa buildings, as if they were the original Sri Lankan buildings. Now, there's plenty of other things that Sri Lankan architecture is apart from that. Um, but there's particularly, uh, I think he created a vernacular, a vernacular. I think there's always an interesting thing about tradition, that tradition is invented. Tradition doesn't exist. You know, tradition's something we make up. And he made up a wonderful tra Sri Lankan architectural tradition. The massive challenge is what do you do when they're doubling the size of the city and building a flyover and an airport? Um, and I think that's where um, making those buildings work is very different. I, I think, as Robert mentioned, he changed register in big buildings. You know, a lot of the time they look like very big hospitals and they're kind of very pragmatic. The one where that's not the case is the parliament uh, of Sri Lanka, which is built as a kind of enormous Candian audience hall um, or a gigantic Bentota Beach Hotel, kind of um, on, on a vast scale. But what it loses at that huge scale is the softness of construction. You can't throw mud at a wall infinitely. Uh, you can't retrieve a million shutters from old buildings. You know, you, you have to actually start building new stuff, and I think that's where it gets very difficult. And so I think there is an also, it's, it's actually that pragmatic other architecture that's really maybe useful to think about in these big-scale urban situations. There's one building of his that's hardly ever publicized that was a, a kind of bioclimatic skyscraper or an early bioclimatic skyscraper. You know, how do you make a big building where it's not all covered in glass and has to be air conditioned? How do you make it where actually you could use natural ventilation? And there's a whole conversation about how that happens in, for example, Singapore, where it's incredibly sophisticated, or Kuala Lumpur, where the kind of people are working with that kind of thing. So I think, yeah, vernacular is, you know, made for, for cottages of peasants in the fields, and it's pretty tough when you're building a gigantic city of millions uh, to, to apply that. Uh, in, in, in a different context. Um, and I think that's the kind of crucial ongoing experiment. Um, 
we talk you mentioned that uh, clients act as patrons and um, it, it, they're they collaborators they're, it, it's very important to have um, clients by your side and when Bawa was working I'm uh, Jay Vardhani was J. Vardhani had commissioned him for the parliament and subsequently his asked them to work on their family home. Um, so maybe if the two of you could just talk about um, the importance of patronage and the right kind of patronage at the right time and uh, Jai Vardhani's contribution to the architecture. Yeah, so I'll talk a bit about uh, uh, Pradeep Jai uh, the grandson, who um, at the end of Baba's career in the late 90s, um, wanted to get the house built on a beautiful plot of land on a cliff overlooking the ocean. The house was sh I showed earlier with this very tin roof. Um, it's called the Cliff House, the Jawadena House. Um, and he was aware of Bawa's work, but he asked some architects to prepare a plan for him. And at some point, he visited uh, Luna Ganga and he was sold. He said, okay, I have to have this architect. So he kind of hounded him and um, said, okay, please, can you make this, this house for me? Um, and after a while, Baba started, you know, he was already old, so I, I guess he uh, wasn't feeling that up to it anymore. Um, but he said, okay, let me, let me come and visit the site and then I'll think about it. So at some, po some point he visited the site and it drove up and saw this big jungle on the top of the cliff. And he said, well, you know, I, I can't visualize it. I, there's too much jungle here. Just cut all the trees. Cut all the trees and then I'll come back. So of course it was quite a radical um, uh, approach. And, and I, I've mentioned that earlier. It's often very radical what Baba does. It all always looks so simple and as if you know, you have a little piece of architecture that you sit nicely between the trees and you don't touch anything. And But it was not like that, right? So, well, he did it. He cut the trees. And then he realized, well, this is such a beautiful site. I've got a beautiful uh, cliff view of the this, this surrounding now. Uh, I actually shouldn't build a house anymore. <laughs> right? I shouldn't build a house here on this hill. So he called Baba, like, okay, um, yeah, you know, I've, I've looked at it. I think, you know, it's fantastic what you've told, uh, taught me. That was the, the biggest le lesson that you learned me, that you taught me. Uh, maybe you should build a house underground. And then uh, Baba said, no, no, it's too complicated. It's, it's, you have to cut the rock. It's going to be too costly and it's going to leak and all that. So he said, no, no, let's not do that. Um, so he said, let me think about it, but I, you, I need some time. I need a couple of months because a good idea needs time, right? So that's also in a way like if you talk about patronage, like kind of waiting for that and, and maybe also from the, at the end, from the architect's point of view, making the, the client wait, right? Uh, building up anticipation, that's part of the process. Um, so after six months, he came back, he came to the site. He had this tiny little postage stamp sketch of a, one contour of the of the uh, the cliff and a single line drawn on top of that as the indicating the roof and Pradeep was sold he said yeah this is what we're going to do um, Baba so it's also interesting to to note that it was not only a one-way traffic so somehow that idea of the underground house had registered so he built some of the rooms under half in the ground so that the roof was really free to cover the entire uh, hill without having a, a block of rooms sitting at the back of it and obscuring that. It became simple and it kind of through that collaboration and trust from the client to the architect, on the other hand, the architect listening, it be, it, that idea became elevated. I think he also, want, uh, Padep had been thinking about it and he said, okay, maybe we should do a, a grass roof on top, uh, concrete and then grass roof, but I said, no, it's gonna leak and it's not gonna work. I, I don't know why, because uh, um, Kanlama, he built with a grass roof, so. Uh, What's the wind, actually, yeah, yes, so you'd have this night. 
you know, it's, 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 it's cliff, and, and I guess yeah. it became too heavy, but it maybe used the idea of yeah, that it would lead to say, okay, let's not do it. But the columns would have become too heavy, the roof would have become too heavy, so he just did this single sh sheet, steel sheet on top of the columns, and the columns kind of enforcing the rhythm of some of the trees that were still kept uh, on site. So uh, that's why Bawa is a great architect, because <laughs> clients listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the difference. Uh, no, jokes aside, it's, it's very difficult to get clients to listen to you. And when they do listen to you, then they listen to the, sometimes the bad ideas that you have. So it's, you need to always throw in the right <laughs> direction. It's like a bit like Inception, if you've seen, you know, just like put the idea there, then act like you're not interested. So hopefully they come back with it. <laughs> yeah. I remember the first, about the first day I arrived in his office, um, he had been designing a house for Minal Modi, who was a lady who was building a farm outside Delhi um, in that kind of rocky, thorny, bushy bit sort of southwest of Delhi. And, um, and what he, this was the ultimate client manipulation kind of thing. He was so clever. So what he did is he drew a plan which she couldn't understand. It was a very abstract plan. And then he got Channa. Uh, to draw a beautiful Singhalese lion and write in calligraphy this beautiful letter uh, in the corner of the drawing uh, saying, Dearest Minal, I'm now going to describe to you the experience of arriving in this house. Your Rolls Royce, obviously, uh, will be going through uh, the wilderness. Uh, you will come under an arch. The road will swing round and arrive in front of a pair of temple doors. The bells will ring as the doors swing open, and you will be standing there in a sari of cloth of silver in a courtyard surrounded by four roaring fireplaces in the starry Delhi winter night. The point being that the architecture is an experience, um, and it, it's not an abstract uh, an abstraction or a construction. Uh, what a client might understand is the experience that they might enjoy uh, by being in a building. Um, actually, the building didn't get built, so maybe it didn't work. But, <laughs> it a, uh, but it was a wonderful thing in the art of how do you persuade uh, a client? Fox them was the answer. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's true. You are actually giving the client a lifestyle. You're not just giving them a building. You're giving them a lifestyle. So, the, I mean, uh, the, his work is often copied across the region from Indonesia to India. Um, and I think at some point uh, there, was a a, there was a collaborative uh, which, which was called Come Out From Under the Bawa Umbrella to uh, urging architects to learn from Bawa and not copy Bawa. Would any of you care to comment on that? <laughs> I don't know about this. <laughs> Actually, I, I saw something yesterday, which was um, some student projects in uh, in Ahmedabad, where where students had been working on a project as if they were different architects. And there was one of the students who had been working as Jeffrey Bauer, designing a building in Udaipur, which is as most unlike anywhere in Sri Lanka as you could conceivably imagine. But I think what it raised was a really interesting thing about like working like somebody and copying somebody and the difference between them. Because if you're doing something that's rooted in a place, then the last thing that there's any point in doing is building a great big spreading tiled roof and a timber building in Rajasthan. I mean, actually, the student didn't. They did really interesting other things. But it was kind of... that, And that's the kind of interesting thing about that kind of regionalist approach is, 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 is it's the approach that's, that's the crucial thing um, rather than the look. Now, in places like, you know, you go to Bali or something, or the Amman chain, a fantastically uh, successful hotel chain, who bring this really interesting sense of that approach. And initially, it was all tropical and green and very Bawa-like, and now they're kind of doing things in the desert in Colorado. And it's really interesting that it's become very Colorado-like, actually. Uh, and, uh, and so how do you, how do you t spread an approach to a different place? I think it's an interesting one. 
Robert, you worked on a few of his sites um, after the ex after the retrospective. So, what happens to his buildings? What happens to his legacy? How does one take care of it? Uh, well, I think Sri Lanka is quite interesting in in this respect because, uh, in maybe in contrast to what we know of India, where, uh, for example, in Delhi, uh, the Nation Hall, uh, Hall of Nations, was demolished, an iconic building uh, that was a landmark in architectural history. Here, a simple project like uh, the Ina de Silva House, which was equally pivotal in, in architectural history of this region, uh, had to be brought down because of, uh, well, next to it, there was a, a hospital, and the hospital needed to expand, so they had to build a parking garage on top of the house. So this beautiful uh, little courtyard house, it was the kind of the first of its kind, um, had, to, uh, had to make way. Uh, because of uh, uh, yeah, urbanization. Uh, and what uh, the uh, Jeffrey Baba Trust did, and I guess uh, um, a lot with the help from a lot of sponsors, was actually to demolish the house, mark each and every tile, each and every brick, number it like archaeologists, ship it to Lunaganga, and rebuild it completely. And this is a house from 1960 which 1962 or so. Uh, so it's, uh, well, uh, under 60 years, uh, 60, 70 years old and, and already has uh, get, uh, received that kind of appreciation as a modern architectural heritage. Um, I, uh, any, anything else that anyone would like to focus on that we have not covered? Otherwise, I'll throw it open to the audience now. Anything anyone would care to? Um, so I think we'll take questions now from the audience. Would Does anyone want to ask anything? It's incredibly remarkable the way also wonderfully described that uh, how it was incredibly planned and manipulated. Yet it was a kind of invisible, endless drawing of his in, in garden, uh, garden landscaping. How much of that aspect of Bhava uh, was visible? Since you said, you know, it was like very tricky visual balance and was appreciated as much as his uh, architecture. Because somewhere I read that uh, he used to love these uh, champa trees, you know, temple flower they call it, I think, in Sri Lanka. And he used to hang different weights from different branches and keep changing them to give them a desired shapes. So my question was that how much of his so intricately, sophisticatedly worked efforts in landscapes were appreciated and recognized? <coughs> So, so my understanding is that uh, it, and I think Ed also hinted to it, to the, to the element, the lanterns next to the paddy fields, it's extremely uh, precisely uh, man manipulated. And, you know, I've talked about, you know, the, the, the garden as a Jackson Pollock painting and this, the kind of the seamless, uh, difference between, uh, uh, no difference between the inside and the outside. But it's also very, very different, I guess, from uh, like uh, what maybe we all know is as the glass house, uh, Philip Johnson or Mies van der Rohe, which is a box just enclosed with glass where everything is uh, continuous. Here, there, the nature uh, was almost, you know, there was a lawn and uh, manipulated, therefore, because nature doesn't really have lawns, right? Trees were also manipulated, the, the placement of them. But here in the garden of Jeffrey Baba, what happened is that that uh, nature appears to be wild, right? We know it's not wild. We know that it cannot be wild because everywhere we intervene, right? Everywhere we as people leave a footprint. Uh, but it it was very much uh, a kind of an idea that 
um, uh, you would have a great variety uh, of experiences of nature, whether it was in a courtyard, or whether it was a window with right in front of it, uh, a, a, a verdant palm leaf, or whether it was something far in the distance. And that, that constant, uh, constant change in depths and in, uh, uh, in, in proximity uh, of spatial experience in the landscape. Her, uh, trees were not trees, they were walls creating a space. And in that sense, I feel that it, it is very, very highly uh, designed. Yeah, in terms of the kind of, I guess, the impact and the popularity of that way of making landscapes, um, I mean, the garden itself during his lifetime was a private place. So it, it was, you kind of, you know, did everything you could to get an invitation there. Um, and uh, that was the way that you would see it. But actually, one of the interesting questions, I think, now, and it comes to the kind of legacy, is how people are looking after a garden and how do you preserve and conserve a garden? Because it doesn't do what buildings do, you hope, which is a sit still. You know, that, those trees are continuous. Uh, and they've had to chop, for example, a crucial tree down and, and plant it again um, in order to kind of maintain the picture. Uh, and I think one of the interesting things is how what was the lessons learnt in a private context in his garden were then applied to much larger public projects. So I think Robert was showing an image of um, Rahuna University, which is a very big university campus, where if you walk around there, that's filled with quotations from that garden. Or like there's a local college at a place called Piliandala, and it's like walking around this kind of memories or jumbled memories uh, of that garden uh, repeated. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it, it's something where it's, it's learned so much from the Sri Lankan landscape as well. I think there's a particular thing about Sri Lankan landscape in the tropical part of the country anyway, that's unbelievably gardened. You know, every, when you get a landscape of rice terraces, you can't conceive of nature because it's already, you know, been gardened for thousands of years. Um, and he kind of frames that, yeah. I think what uh, people very often forget is that landscape is also designed and it's a part of architecture. So with uh, modern architecture, people tend to think of the tectonics or the structure and just the built form, which is cement, concrete, steel, or maybe wood or whatever. And they tend to leave the rest now in the age of super spe specialization to another profession, which is landscape architecture. So it's kind of dealing with the entirety in one when you kind of, uh, so I think you need to, that's what he did. He thought about things in a whole. So, yeah. So it's not very separate, actually. It's like how you bend a beam or you turn something around so you have a view. You plant accordingly. It's quite logical. Any other questions? Uh, this is to Robert. Uh, Robert, uh, when you... Um, I mean, when uh, Bawa was, uh, I mean, he was a lover of nature. So was there a question of sustainability as we talk about today? And I guess the project you were referring to was this Forest Hills Tala. Is that right? Uh, so I, I did see that, and I love the influences. And uh, even, even the use of the laterite, the use of the material, the glass house, the caves. So, I mean, uh, could you describe a few of the influences used there? So I'm not sure if I understand you. You you are asking to describe some influences that that we had from Jeffrey Baba's work, right? So I think um, what what um, I probably try to highlight in in, in the project also uh, that I showed uh, the riparian house at the end uh, here. And, and we've not spoken really about that uh, yet, is that uh, for Bawa uh, architecture, uh, you know, he didn't like drawings, right? And he didn't want to uh, really uh, experience architecture through drawings, and he thought that it, wasn't, that it wasn't possible. You had to experience architecture by actually being in a space and moving through a space. And he was the kind of the perfect 
kind of cinematographer of architecture where uh, he would set up uh, a, a starting point and build up an anticipation, build up climax, small plot climax, pl climaxes, and then eventually the reveal. Uh, the Triton Hotel is a, is a great example of that where you kind of con uh, drive through this very narrow winding road and then f suddenly you, you see an expanse of palm trees plotted out in uh, a, a pond uh, similar to uh, Ellen's uh, pool. And that extends into uh, uh, the columns of the, the lobby and then it extends into a, another pool and then it extends into the beach. And this house, what we designed, this, this, this kind of uh, sequence of spaces was very carefully choreo choreographed, how you actually, uh, um, how you approach an, a, a piece of architecture, what you see, what you don't see. Uh, that's very important also, what you actually reveal at until at some point you kind of uh, con conceal it. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think that's, that's one of the, the aspects that, that is very important for, for our work. Um, what, what we also felt, and I think that's really a part of um, uh, a kind of someone's background, is that the, the, our, our my nature and our nature in a practice was n really not something to improvise on a site, for example. So we had been always uh, un uncomfortable with that. And in our work, we actually draw up everything. We know everything before we start construction. So it's kind of the complete opposite of uh, what, what Baba does. And, uh, uh, and, and, and that has an influence on, on the way do you do your work. But it's also um, the uh, the fact that uh, we felt that <coughs> um, uh, architecture and the way we live changes and it changes over time and what the challenge that we are facing now as a society was different from what it was when Bawa designed and I think he was uh, a visionary in terms of the Kandalama Hotel um, in, in, in how that hotel is, is, a, is a kind of a formidable piece of sustainable architecture. I think he received many followers of that. But uh, there are also uh, many other kind of challenges that we are now having to face. Uh, and I, we would never be able to uh, chop off a whole mountain and say, <laughs> okay, build a house there, right? And, and so in a way, we look also at the architecture as a, from a much more conceptual point of view of really what is the essence of, uh, of a project. Uh, what do you want to say with it? What is the um, idea behind it and how does that architecture kind of convey that? Um, uh, I have two questions for you. So thank you for the wonderful presentations. So I noticed in all the presentations you all did, they were mostly residential and maybe a few hotels. Is there any examples or good examples of commercial for offices done in the Bawa style of, of architecture? And second thing is, is Bawa the actual the godfather or the pioneer of sustainable architecture? Is he one of the early leaders? Yeah, so in terms of kind of non-domestic uh, buildings. Um, there were quite a lot of kind of educational things, and but again, they tended to be in a kind of very rural context or largely rural context. So they might be um, kind of pavilions in the in the in the countryside. Um, as I say, there was actually this enormous um, near kind of Union Place of Slave Island in the middle of Colombo. This kind of tower, which certainly when I was there, I never realised it was by him because it looked so different. It's this enormous concrete. Uh, tower with very very deep set windows so it's one of these ones where you know if the sun hits the glass then it's a disaster uh, you know in any tropical situation so you've got to recess everything as much as you can um, and the building was designed to deal with kind of cross ventilation uh, through through the tower um, so it was an early model uh, of that kind uh, of thing um, what there wasn't and because there were such a thing just didn't exist at that time in Sri Lanka at all was flats and apartments. I mean, if, if you mentioned to somebody living in a flat, 
those kind of ghoul face apartments just next to the ghoul face hotel but there was literally no such thing you know people lived in houses or aspired to live in houses uh, and the idea of living all together would have been inconceivable in the 1970s or the 80 in 80s even in a big city like colombo um so it would have been very different um as to the sustainable question um it arose um but i and i think sometimes that was by kind of choice i mean one has to remember in the 1960s like, who was sustainable anyway you know did anyone want anything except plastic and air conditioning and um uh, and it but and so in a sense sustainability was imposed at that time by the lack of availability of any resources from outside sri lanka um it was very you know so people had very little aspiration uh towards sustainability but 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 actually it was something that people were doing out of necessity um later on i think that that was actually a real a, a, a real particular uh, interest um and particularly to do with the kind of environment that a building might create i mean we were talking about you know the incredibly minimal jai wardner house which is a roof um and minimizing the the area that you would have to air condition so that most of your life is lived outside the bubble um and, and most of the area is outside the bubble um, but again initially that comes out of you know there wasn't such a thing um uh, and it was finding ways traditional ways of accommodating uh dealing with that kind of thing it's mentioned this 40 years long career of mr bawa which was the area means which were the years where they were active like so he stopped practicing kind of mid 90s wasn't it yeah so it was kind of mid 50s to mid 90s yeah um so so kind of from about 10 years post independence really in sri lanka and onwards yeah excuse me uh we talk a lot about uh heritage and things like that but uh, do you plan to have workshops where um these ideas are continued oh, it's okay uh would you like to um uh where these ideas are continued so do you have workshops involved because my aunt had a house and she knew how to weave the thatch of that house but uh, we never learned how to do that so that was lost completely so is there any way to sustain these kind of values i mean like not to copy but like you said to um, innovate and to improve on those i don't know if i'm making myself clear but things like a, a workshops that could be organized on a, i don't know how often you can but it's just a suggestion well i i, I do know <laughs> there are several organizations and um, ngos who work around the country with mm. local materials with for example mud uh, construction or uh, rammed earth construction uh, and they occasionally organize workshops there's for example one in karja that i know of that organizes workshops hi i've actually stayed at heritage kanulama so i must compliment you on the bathroom z uh, <laughs> my uh, question is more of a sort of um, uh, uh, ask rather from you if you could share any more personal anecdotes of working with uh, jeffrey or some outrageous thing <laughs> uh, yeah yeah there were quite a lot of outrageous things no it, he was a very um kind of reserved person we was when i knew him but probably because i was kind of 22 and he was 72 so he probably thought who is this squirt uh, <laughs> uh around um the office but i think the thing that was really striking was this kind of he lived his life in this particularly kind of ritualized way um so i think i described coming into the house and you kind of wait in a room and then you're shown into the presence and so on and the and kind of actually the whole thing at that age of his life that, that w- was like that it, it was like a kind of operatic performance and every weekend he would go to lunaganga and it was a kind of procession <laughs> uh and then when he was there you know prince charles came to visit sri lanka and when he arrived at, uh, at lunaganga you know 
Geoffrey Bell was sitting with a drink in the corner and didn't stand up, and that was Prince Charles who had to stand while he was talking to, <laughs> to Geoffrey Bell. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and so, but actually, it really fitted with this kind of, this, this architecture of these particular places. I mean, what, what we were talking a little bit about landscape and the continuity of, kind of buildings and landscape. To him, like exactly where the ashtray went and exactly whether the chair was like that or that was indescribably important because that's exactly the same as where is the mountain uh, as the sun sets behind it 25 miles away. And so he had this particular, yeah, this uh, sort of everything was kind of, I guess by the time he was that age, it had kind of been sorted out. You know, he kind of knew how to do these things. So, so when one Dalmatian died, he'd just get another one that looked exactly the same because it would match the house. But then he allowed himself another little white fluffy dog called Fang, you know, who was kind of allowed to, <laughs> to run around. <laughs> and, um, and, and so, yeah. But then you looked at photographs of his youthful life, which was something quite different and quite racy and glamorous. Um, I mean, the, the, the other person, if one pe people say, why did Geoffrey Barwell become an architect? The other reason he became an architect is his brother, um, uh, Bevis Barwell, who, um, Geoffrey Barwell was very tall and very thin and very white. Um, Bevis Barwell was very tall and very thin and very black. Um, and they were, they weren't twins, but they were kind of twins. Um, and Bevis was slightly older and had been building another garden down the road. Um, so if any of you go to Sri Lanka and you want the secret to uh, Lunuganga is, is spot A, but go to Brief, uh, his brother's garden, which is a kind of the rival garden. And, and, and the reason they started, he got into architecture, is he'd been competitively gardening. And there was action painting, but there's also competitive gardening uh, with his brother. Um, and, uh, and eventually he thought, well, why don't I do this for a living? Um, and, and, uh, and it sort of came out of that, but, but they shared a friend um, called Donald Friend, uh, an Australian artist, um, who, there are lots of murals in both of their gardens, in Brief and Lunaganga, which, which draw, Donald Friend was a kind of surrealist, a kind of, of the, uh, and he, he drew, he visualized this strange, surreal Sri Lanka of collage buildings and urns and Apollos above rice paddies that in a sense then Geoffrey Bower went on to build uh, later and in his bedroom uh, in his house which you can visit in Sri Lanka is on the left as you go in is this wonderful mad drawing or kind of copy of a wonderful mad drawing by Donald Friend um, which kind of shows this imagined Sri Lanka uh, which, which in a sense in, in lots of ways he, he spent his career building. There are any lessons we can learn from Bauer's approach and work um, for Bombay in the context of urban planning and open spaces? <laughs> right, set me up, and then I'll put my head on the block right here. And uh, <laughs> um, the, I would have thought the, the chief one is the, is this one about big scale. Um, and density, and, and how you take some of those approaches. I think, for example, there's a very pragmatic one, the Ina de Silva house we've all been talking about, was, was built, like many of, of Bawa's own urban houses, to try and get rid of the kind of bungalow myth, the terrible colonial legacy that what a proper person must have is a house with a garden round it, and then there's a wall, and then there's the next person's house with a garden around it. And what you end up with, by the time everyone's built some extensions, is about 20 centimetres of filth in between the two, with 16 people living in each bungalow. And so what he built was courtyard houses on the basis that actually, you know, what you should have is the garden in the middle, the house around the outside, because actually it's a way of dealing at that scale with urban density. Now, that doesn't work at 89 floors, obviously. <laughs> Um, but it was pragmatic ways of, of trying to deal with the gradual uh, densification uh, of it. I wonder whether there's another thought, which is that the great potential of this city is that it's is the views, um, and sometimes those views are out of it or up. You know, you 
you can look across to Malabar Hill or you can look out at the sea or something. And that does some amazing psychological effect when you're stuck in a tiny street. Um, and that, that op but actually, sometimes that can be eternal. I was walking through the fort today, and there was suddenly you'd see, you know, the Tower of the University kind of, and actually it has the same effect as seeing a mountain. And, and it's introducing that sense of distance in a dense city is maybe an interesting kind of strategy to think about. But these guys have been designing actual things. The simple uh, equation is you respond to your climate, you respond to your situation, you respond to the time, you respond to the zone. Simply put, a glass building will be overloading in terms of heat, in terms of air conditioning, and will also offset that heat onto the rest of the city, as well as an air-conditioned car. It sets off the heat there, as will more roads. So the, the logic has to be up, down, and down, up. I mean, you can't, uh, I mean, frankly, Baba was like, again, like, kind of what we are architect to the rich people, you know, you don't just like, it's not for the, for the masses, and it's not at the urban scale, you don't see the influence there. But if you apply the same logic, you would get a much better result. And it has to be um, from the government, it has to be from the people also. So um, it's not very different. You just have to approach it with the same thought process. It's a different scale. And it multiplies. That's the difference. Uh, I think there are lots of examples, but most of the open spaces are locked up through the day. Um, and that's a very big problem because we have a lot of open space. Unfortunately, most of the open spaces, the so-called parks, are open about uh, six hours of the day out of 24 hours. Whereas the parking is open 24-7, and the parking is occupied by an unoccupied car, <laughs> which <laughs> is just there for its life cycle. So, I mean, really, I mean, it's, it's more of a strategy and a policy thing. You just say, you know, we are blessed with very good climate. Trees grow by themselves, and it's pretty good. So people take it for granted and kind of abuse it. That's the, that's the fallout. Whereas in the West, I think they work harder to kind of keep the greenery and to keep things nice. They have to like protect the rosebuds and all. So it's a lot more effort, so they respect it a lot more. Here we take, you know, your tropics, fruits grow off the trees, you can just live comfortably one shirt through the year, except when the air conditioning is like <laughs> super cooling you. <laughs> so, and uh, no architecture is sustainable, I mean. We try to achieve that, but if you build anything, you're already destroying the planet. So, yes. Um. I just wanted to add to that idea of garden. Eh? We're, wo we're working on some parks together. And, and put that uh, immediately back to the situation in Sri Lanka and the idea that, uh, that nature and nature cannot be harmed and you cannot touch trees and things like that. And here we have also this in Bombay, this kind of uh, very nervous uh, situation when we talk about parks that everything has to be green, and as soon as something, someone builds something there, it becomes a big uh, cry, and no, no, we can't do that, because we're all afraid that it will overtake those green parks. But if you were, actually, if you look at the situations in Sri Lanka and Jeffrey Bauer, architecture and nature, nature coexisted. And architecture was required for us to enjoy nature. You require the pavilion with a nice roof to sit out in the monsoon to enjoy the park. And in Bombay, we cannot do that because, you know, the fear of the, of the concretization of the city. Um, the Bombay Chol system exists around the whole courtyard. If you see, study some of the old Chols, the way they are made, would you say that any of the construction of the mill era of Bombay, which where the Chols were built, was any influence from something like that? Because there's a lot of architecture within the Chols which are now being dis demolished totally. Well, I, I think the Chol system came from a, from a, a different typology. It was a derived from a different typology. But certainly the principles of the chawl of a long veranda, actually you see it in the Bantra Beach Hotel. Uh, the Bantra Beach Hotel is a chawl, right? Overlooking a beautiful beach. So the principle of a veranda uh, acting as a 
between space, between indoor and outdoor, where you have the circulation on one side, you go into a room and then you have a view on the other side. I think the chawl is, ha is, is, is the problem, it, it doesn't have the view on the <laughs> other side. Uh, but the, that, that, that architectural typology is, is very similar. Thank you to our esteemed panelists. This was a very engaging discussion. I think we all want more. They'll be around for a few more questions. Thank you to our audience. I know it's still feeling almost tropical in there. I know we've had over 200 people, so apologize the AC didn't kick in. But thank you for being here. Thank you to our partners, uh, University of Edinburgh, Amrita Sadrangani, for loaning us Ed again. Um, at Avid, we have wonderful programs lined up. I urge you all to uh, check out on social media. But this next weekend, in this very room, we are actually leading a seminar on arts management. Uh, it's a full day program with presentations and, and panel discussions. So especially a lot of the young uh, students out here, I think y'all will really benefit with it. So just pick up some information on the way. Thank you for coming and have a good night. Thank you.